everyone, and welcome to University College's Quick Connections, our webinar series that explores relevant and timely topics and how we are navigating challenges of our time. Today, we have invited Dr. Jack Buffington, who leads supply chain management programs at the University of Denver, to share with us how the impact of COVID-19 is having on supply chains and, and management of supply chain networks. My name is Chris Nicholson, Assistant Dean of Enrollment Marketing and Partnerships at University College, and I will serve as moderator for today's webinar. Before we get started, let me share a few quick details about today's session. First, we welcome your questions throughout the presentation, and we will be sure to leave time at the end of Jack's presentation to answer as many questions as we can. Um, as, as you do have questions, please type them into the Zoom chat feature um, near the bottom of your Zoom screen. And again, we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Second, to help ensure strong audio quality, please make sure your mic is on mute. Um, by clicking on the microphone, uh, again, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And last, our webinar today is being recorded, uh, a link to which will be sent to all registered attendees. Um, you may also access the webinar on Vimeo. Um, just Google the, the webinar's name, um, and, and that should come up for you. That, that Vimeo link will be posted uh, about within 24 hours. At the, after the conclusion of the webinar. Um, with that, uh, I am absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Jack Buffington. Uh, Jack serves as Professor of the Practice and Pro Program Director for Supply Chain Management Programs at the University of Denver. Uh, Jack has held various leadership roles in supply chain, manufacturing, information technology, and consulting across several industries. Um, he received his PhD in supply chain at the Luleå University of Technology in Luleå, Sweden. Uh, and he also has a postdoc at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, Jack has written uh, numerous books um, and has had numerous peer reviewed articles published on supply chain and related topics and is uh, an in-demand supply chain management expert, uh, especially now. Um, indeed, it seems like Jack is, is giving an interview and, and publishing articles ne nearly daily. So with that, Jack, thank you for uh, joining us today, and let's begin. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Um, I looked at the list. There's a lot of people that, a lot of you that I know, so it's good to see you guys. Um, and some of you are new, it's, it's nice to meet you. And um, as, as we go through this presentation, um, a couple disclosures to start off with. Um, we're gonna talk about the supply chain and it's related to COVID. Um, it's clear, I mean, Chris mentioned I'm a doctor, but like what my daughter told me when I graduated from my degree, I'm not the type of doctor that helps people. So, uh, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. So um, I'm not an immunologist. So um, there won't be any sort of references to any of this stuff other than how it relates to supply chain management. And then the second um, disclosure is this is, I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes and answer questions. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of information that I'm gonna provide to you. So um, if there's any follow-up information that you'd like, I can provide that to you. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can in 15 minutes and then we'll follow up with, with additional questions. So um, everything I'm gonna share with you is, is based on um, what I consider to be pretty solid research and, and information out there. Of course, um, there's a lot that we don't know about what's going on here, but um, we'll go from there and uh, we'll see how it works, okay? Um, this, okay, let's make sure that any, the pages aren't turning. Oh, there we go. Um, it's probably a bad pun to say that supply chain is going viral um, but it is true, and Chris is right, there is a lot of interest right now in supply chains. For most of you who are in the field, this is a good thing. Um, so there'll be great opportunities for you in your career, for your businesses in the long term. Um, and, you know, the, the good news is, is that more of the general population is interested in what's happening. 
I've always told my students, and I've seen a couple of my students on, online, so you'll hear this one again, that um, before nobody was really interested in supply chain, and the reason why is because everything's very predictable, right? So you don't really have to think about supply chain because, you know, your, your packages show up on time, right? Um, you don't really have to worry about these things. It's something that's very predictable. Um, you know, packages show up at your doorstep after you click it for Amazon, all these things happen, right? So today, everybody wants to know what's happening. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, what the supply chain looked like before COVID, because this is truly a um, tipping point in how supply chains are working. And what I'm going to tell you is that some of what's happening today has been building up. So it's, you can't blame it all on COVID. It's COVID is more of a tipping point than a cause, a cause and effect. So we'll talk about what the supply chains look like today relative to what's happening with COVID. And then of course, uh, what will happen in the future after this. Okay, a um, couple of interesting slides here. I think a lot of you understand this, but I just wanna make sure we ground everybody. If you look at globalization as a total percent, uh, percent of, the, of the economy, it's massive, right? And these are different studies that show um, what impact supply chain has had, uh, you know, what, what percent of the economy has been global. And you can see over probably about 50 or 60 years, this has grown dramatically through what I call the two O's. The two O's are oil, so energy, and organization. And that organization is truly defined by the system called supply chain that a lot of us are a part of. So before there were global markets, but it's much different from something being a global market to being a supply chain that we'll talk about. Um, another interesting slide of, of how this whole supply chain thing came about is um, the reduction in costs of fluidity, how, how fluid our, our supply chains are today, right? And so the three, the three um, flows that are very important in supply chain are financial flows, information flows, and product flows. And as you can see in this chart, the cost of these flows have been decreased dramatically um, in a way where uh, globalization works. So you can see the, the cost of sea freight. And for the most part, uh, moving something across the ocean that's made overseas is practically free, right? So this has enabled global markets to be much more effective. And then you see the international calling costs, which we can today define as the internet, right? So how information is flowing across the world has um, the cost is, is pretty much nothing. And that also um, applies to how, how financial flows happen across the world. So these flows that have changed over the last 20 years has enabled this just dramatic um, globalization of our supply chains as we know them today. Um, so even though these these um, supply, well, actually, as a result of this global supply chain, you can see in this chart, um, for the last 10 years, the, um, the global economy has do, been doing really well, and the United States has been doing really well. If you can look at um, these factors, um, right before the whole COVID thing hit, you can see the indicators show the United States economy is very strong. Uh, but what we're going to talk about in this presentation is that may be true, uh, but there's some underlying weaknesses that exist beyond the numbers that some trigger was going to set off. And it just happened to be that this trigger was COVID, uh, but, but it was bound to happen. Okay. Slide stuck. Okay. So um, I, I did that disclosure to you. Um, because this slide that I'm showing you here to talk about this unprecedented disruption, this is not to make any sort of uh, call on what COVID is, um, its, its impact. But what's really important to see in this slide is how quickly this became an event, not only a medical event, but a supply chain event. So if you, you look at this slide, it shows um, you know, the, the deaths per million that happens um, in the United States. Just in a matter of a month, this became an issue, right? Um, so again, there's, there's people who are looking at this from a medical standpoint and trying to figure out what, what do we do about this? There's, there's people who are looking at the economy 
So I'm looking at this from a supply chain standpoint. And um, a lot of you are in supply chain and you know that the most, the most, the biggest impact, the, 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 the worst thing that can happen to a supply chain is variation, right? So we have these large global supply chains, um, long tail global systems that operate very efficiently when there's low variation. And as you can see from this slide, this is massive disruption to the supply chain. And I'm going to talk in a, in a few other slides about how this whole disruption transpired. Um, but there's been weaknesses in our supply chain before COVID. We have to acknowledge that. We've seen these things appear in forms such as trade wars and um, impacts to jobs and um, some other, some other triggers that I'll share with you, but we just have to be aware that the, these exist. Then all of a sudden what happened in the fourth quarter of 2019 um, and is expected to continue through 2020 is this impact as a function of this virus, right? This virus that uh, is very unprecedented because it spread, it spread across the world in a very quick fashion, right? And if you look at some of these other um, viruses that have happened, you can see the the Asian flu or the um, 2017 flu, right? These are these are viruses that were much more gradual, right? And you could show Ebola on here, or you could show SARS, and none of these other pandemics had the same quick impact on the world as what's happening today with COVID. So, um, and what we're going to show in a couple slides is that this created an unprecedented disruption across the entire planet that started in Asia uh, and, has, and has moved to Europe and every other continent. This was a triggering event. Today, we still don't understand enough about it. There's not sufficient data and analysis to diagnose a threat. So again, this creates this problem when there's insufficient information to understand what's happening, that's gonna lead to this, this major disruption that we're seeing today in the supply chain. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, before we get to some of the disruptions, what I wanted to show you here are some different perspectives on what's happening, um, what's going to happen to the world economy. So according to this, according to Deutsche Bank, um, you can see the gray line that shows uh, the expected um, world GDP um, over 2019 through 2020. So you can see it's essentially a a very flat um, 3 3.75, 4% growth rate year over year across the world, right? Um, and that's what supply chains like to see, right? They like to see growth. They like to see consistency. Um, they don't like to see variation. And so now you look at the, the light blue line and you look at the, the middle blue line and you can see this variation, right? That, that uh, Deutsche Bank is expecting to see. Um, and if you look at this line, it seems that their expectation is highly correlated to the COVID-19 virus. Um, and I think that is probably not the case. I think that's probably over optimistic. So, th so that sort of GDP forecast will assume that what's happening is, is almost entirely due to this virus. And, uh, what I'm going to show you is some evidence to the contrary that our supply, our global supply chain system was already um, experiencing some problems that were going to permeate and it was going to be some other sort of trigger that was going to trigger it, but it was going to happen. So if you think about this, if you think about this really large impact to the supply chain through all these lockdowns, um, and then you also had something that was kind of insidiously waiting to happen. Um, that some trigger was going to set off, and now you have this major trigger that's um, that's really not well understood. It's not something as simple as you know a financial crisis or some weather event or a trade war. Um, this is something that's unprecedented. So it's kind of a double whammy. And so my expectation is that the supply chains are not going to recover as quickly as may be expected in in this sort of forecast. Okay, so um, why is that, Jack? Why do, you, why do you think that that is the case? Well, there's this term in supply chain called the bullwhip effect. And some of you 
who are in my class have heard this. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people in supply chain understand this term. Um, if you're not a supply chain expert, um, it would be called the toilet paper effect, right? Because I've spent probably the last two months talking about toilet paper so much that my friends have disparagingly called me Dr. Toilet Paper, right? So this gets into um, what the bullwhip effect is all about is a mismatch between supply and demand. And typically what happens in supply chains is there is a disruption of one that impacts the other. So there could be a disruption of supply. I mean, I'm sorry, there could be a disruption in demand as a result of like a financial crisis, right? So um, people lose their jobs, demand goes down, there's a, there's a mismatch between supply and demand. Um, or there could be a disruption in supply, right? There could be some natural event that happens in some part of the world that disrupts the supply chain. Um, but what's unprecedented about what's happening today is there's pretty much a disruption in both. And not only that being the case, but there's a disruption in both across the planet. And you can see the first curve um, to the left, which shows the disruption that started to happen in China that started to happen in January. Right, so you started to see um, these this order volume that went down, um, and then the lockdown happened in um, late January to late February. The factories started to open, and then all of a sudden um, you started to see in Hubei province in April where the lockdown lockdown started to lift. So that would be just fine if that if the event only happened in one province in China or even just happened in China. Right, or even just happened in Asia. But actually what happened, as we all know, is the disruption happened across the world. And so what you can see on the slide to the right is the transactional volume that happened in the United States, UK, and Eurozone over January through April. And so what you can see um, here in the January and February, this very much looks like what's happening in China. Um, but then all of a sudden what happened in February and March is that all of a sudden the rest of the world went down into lockdown, right? So you have this reverberation of starting in China in provinces where, you know, they're making a lot of parts for automotive, they're making um, electronics, you're seeing all these things that are happening. Um, and then China starts to recover and then the rest of the world gets hit with the same um, problem. So you have this complete volatility between supply and demand. Um, but what's, what's actually exacerbating that problem is the long tail nature of our supply chains, right? So um, if you ship a product from China to the United States or vice versa, it's a 25 day shipping period, right? So you have this uh, delay that's happening between supply and demand, not just because there's a mismatch of what people are buying and what people are able to make, but also because the supply chains are long tail, right? So you, instead of having this model of complete congruence, uh, low cost uh, flows of products, information and finance, you have this incomplete volatile flow of product information and finance that is just really out of control. Right, starting to become a little bit more in control, but you could see how this thing would transpire over time. And um, we could spend a lot more time talking about it, but I wanna get through this a little bit quicker. Okay, um, so what this leads to, in my mind, if you look at, and again, this yellow line, I'm not, I'm not Dr. Fauci, I'm not, um, have, have no knowledge of this, but if you listen to, to um, immun immunologists, what they talk about the, the virus disruption being, is it goes up and then it's under control and then you have these waves, right? Until eventually it goes down to nothing or it's somewhat controlled, right? Um, but if you look at the, the, the supply chain disruption, you're gonna see much larger waves, uh, much larger variation. You can see the variation of the yellow virus is smaller. The red virus is much more significant and then you're starting to see the yellow part as maybe there's a vaccine or herd immunity type things. You know, the vaccine starts to go under control. But then the question is, what happens here, right? What happens with the supply chain? Um, and we should expect that this 
will be longer tailed than the virus. For what reasons? Um, well, there was inherent weakness in the supply chain prior to COVID. Uh, and I could share with you the data. It's going to be hard to kind of go through all this in, in this time period. Um, then we have the greatest supply chain shock in history. And I don't think that's hyperbolic to say that. I think what we're facing is the greatest supply chain shock in history. And if you think about other shocks that have happened, that have taken years to recover, it's only reasonable to expect that this one will take longer, right? And then you, you are gonna start to get this anti-globalization sentiment about supply chains that weren't resilient enough to take care of the healthcare of the population. So I think these three elements together is, is indication that we should expect um, that the supply chain disruption will last longer than the, the pandemic, the medical pandemic. Um, what, two supp what supply chains have the greatest problem of resiliency? What, what did we learn from this? Um, I think the two supply chains we should really look at related to a lack of resiliency are the medical and the food supply chains. Um, the medical supply chain is really obvious, right? We have these points of failure when it comes to masks, the ventilators. Um, you know, if all of a sudden we need resiliency to address some sort of pandemic that's been discussed for years, the supply chains don't support that. Why don't they support that? Um, well, our supply chains are long tailed. Um, you know, there are these large global supply chains that are focused on scale and costs. Um, so because of these long term um, supply chains, they're not built for resiliency, they're built for capacity. Um, so you hear politicians say, well, we, our supply chains need to be resilient. Um, but we need to remind people that they weren't designed to be resilient. They were designed to be um, efficient, um, have great capacity, have low costs, right? Um, so the other problem with the medical supply chain is, is that when supply, when demand is greater than supply, it leads to these forced allocation situations, right? Where uh, if you're the country that's making the mask, you're going to make sure that your population has what they need. Um, and then everybody else is on allocation, right? And this leads into geopolitical conflict of whose supply is what uh, with a multinational corporation. If the corporation is based in the United States, but it produces in China, who gets the mask? Does China get it? Does, um, does the United States get it? Is it allocated evenly across the world, right? Um, the other weakness that we're seeing in the medical supply chain is not just with the manufacturers, but it's also with the distributors and it's with the hospitals. Um, and having spent time with hospital supply chains, I can tell you um, that even in the best times, they're, they're in need of, of improvement. And this leads to problems if they can't manage um, the demand of what's happening, if, especially when there's also a supply problem. Um, we've also seen problems with the food supply chain. And as you can see in this infographic to the right, um, our food supply chains in the United States are largely consolidated, right? They're built for efficiency and costs. Uh, so there are these tightly uh, coupled distribution models in order to make things flow really freely and at a low cost. It's also um, a function of perishability because a lot of these foods um, don't have long shelf lives. Um, so the other thing that we're also seeing happening, especially in the meat industry, is poor supply chain um, practices that have lead to, led to a health crisis, right? So, you know, if you don't have proper manufacturing safety and sanitation techniques, you just exa further exacerbate the problem. So um, one of these is a long-term global challenge, the medical one. One is not necessarily global, but both of these supply chains indicate a lack of resiliency. That is a big problem. So what is the root cause problem that we face here? How do we, how do we address this problem? So as good supply chain people, we follow the process called the five Y, right? So the problem that we've indicated in this presentation is our supply chains lack resiliency, okay? Why do they lack resiliency? Well, they lack resiliency because they're focused on short-term benefits, not resiliency. So before we can go back to um, our supply chain and say, you guys failed at resiliency, we have to really ask the question is, was that the way they were designed? And the answer is they weren't designed in that manner. Okay, so they lack resiliency, they're focused on short-term benefits. Why is that? 
Uh, well, companies and municipalities, what I mean by that is countries, um, different parts of the world, lack a 21st century, century strategy. Well, why is that? Uh, this gets into a lack of supply chain principles that exist within um, our community. Our, our um, function has changed. We used to have these principles that focus, like I'll talk about later on, focused on um, structured problem solving and you know, engineering, math, things like that. Um, and we don't have these principles anymore in supply chain. This is something that we need to change. Um, and then lastly, it's not a technology solution. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's go into this five why, why this is the case. Um, supply chains should be optimized to be resilient and scalable. And we're gonna see a real push for this in the future. Um, uh, citizens are gonna demand this. Um, politicians are gonna promote this. You're gonna see this push for resiliency. But the challenge with that is that's not just so simple to create. You know, we can't just pass laws and say we're gonna have a resilient supply chain. We can't force companies to do things if they're multinational corporations. These things are going to take time. They're going to take some, some really solid thinking on, on what we're really asking for. So how do we design, how do we define resiliency? Um, this ties to risk management, you know, so this ties to public private balance. It ties to things like environmental sustainability. So we have to understand these things. We have to figure out which supply chains we want to focus on first in order to create this resiliency for a country or something like that. Right. Um, we know what scale is, right? It's this large um, mass produced supply chain that focuses on cost and volume. So you can see uh, what I'm proposing here as a model is we need to have this, we need to have this situation where we have both resiliency and scale, and then we have something that's kind of in between. So how could this model look in the future? Well, uh, we could have some supply chains that remain highly scaled and highly focused on costs and volume. Um, in the next five years or so, I think an industry that will remain in this situation is the electronics industry. Um, if you think about a smartphone that takes um, sourcing from 45 different countries, um, very sophisticated advanced manufacturing, is that may not be something um, in the short term that can be moved, um, but maybe it can, maybe for some um, aspects of less electronics like medical, it should be moved, right? But when, it talk, when you talk about consumer electronics, maybe it's not something we should focus on. Um, then, there's, then there's something I think is going to be really relevant in the next five years, and this is something I'm calling omni-channel. So it's both a um, scale and resi resiliency model. So you may have duplicity. Uh, for example, you may make um, pharmaceuticals, you may have like a large scale um, pharmaceutical operation where it exists today, like in China and India. So I think like 70% of our pharmaceuticals are made, at least the, um, the um, active pharmaceutical ingredients is made in these two countries. Um, so you'll still have scale there, but you're going to want to also have resiliency on site, right? You're going to want to have reshoring of this. So you're going to have this, this hybrid model of um, scalability and resiliency in order to be able to manage the supply chain better so we don't get into these situations like we're in now, but we also don't make costs go up so high that people can't afford things. And then the final model is going to get into a future state model where um, it's a network community based on additive manufacturing, um, something that most of you know is 3D printing. Um, so it's going to be this network community of supply chains uh, where various components, healthcare, food is made in communities, right? So it becomes more reliant for a community to be able to produce its own products. Um, it's a customizable and actually to a certain extent scalable because it's small versus really large. So it's a bunch of clusters of, of how supply chain happens versus us relying on two manufacturers that produce things for the entire world. These changes are gonna happen quickly. Um, and what I mean by that is they're probably going to happen in five years. So companies need to start thinking about what this looks like. And I'll talk about that in a few later slides. I'm already at my 30 minute thing. So I'm going to go kind of fast. Um, so, so this is something I don't have to spend a lot of time on, but this, this 20th century model, these economies of scale are no longer practical. And what you see on 
on the right is this model of infinite growth, right? So these supply chains continue to grow um, in this scaled cheap model built on, you know, long tail supply chains, low cost labor. Um, these, these are going to be proven that they're not sustainable, right? They're not, they're not going to be able to last. We've seen this, we're seeing this right now. Um, so we're going to have to build these models. Um, and again, there was a bunch of data that I could share, but of course I didn't have, to, I don't have time to share. That shows that a more resilient model will be a better model for growth and it'll be a different model. Uh, and it's this model that we must balance scale and resiliency. So what do we do? What do companies and countries do? And you're going to see why I'm going to mention the country part. Um, we need to replace these large scale just in time uh, models. Uh, we need to focus on, you know, complete focus on automation and information technology. These are going to be important, but we need to balance them out with other factors um, that I'll talk about in the last two slides. Um, so this, this underlying weakness that I mentioned has been expressing itself for years now um, in terms of trade wars and political shifts and proxy wars, environmental sustainability issues, um, job, you know, wages, everything like that. These things are permeating into big problems. And like I mentioned, just a matter of time for some big event to trigger it. So what do we do about this? Um, and this is going to sound, um, it, it, this is going to take some time for you to really think about this. Um, this is not something that just like, boom, makes sense. Let's just do it. Um, but we need to change our foundation and supply chain away from this short-term um, marketing focus, finance focus that's focusing solely on customers and, um, and investors and restoring supply chain back to its original principles. Um, and we have, to, we have to admit, this is the model that China has. And there's no surprise why, why China is winning the battle of supply chain. Um, their decisions are made by engineers, scientists, technologists. They're doing things um, through STEM. So they have a STEM-based supply chain. And what we have is more of a short-term marketing finance focused supply chain that does well in the short term until it doesn't, right? It's just not sustainable. And you can see what's happening in China with their investments and the collaboration between government and industry and, and how this whole thing is building. And you see a much different model than what we see in the United States. So the principles of supply chain um, that built this great world supply chain that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation are no longer in place or not sufficiently in place in big companies. And for those of us who've worked in manufacturing can appreciate Six Sigma, lean manufacturing, industrial engineering, these tools that we need to, to create a structured problem solving approach in order to restore these principles. And again, I'm, I'm covering this really high level, but this is really the answer to what we need to do both as a nation and companies need to focus on this in their own models. Um, technology is, is part of the answer, but it's not the entire answer. And some of you may have seen a um, Harvard Business Review article that, that was published in 2018 that talked about the end of supply chain management, which really gets into the full automation of the system. And I think there's, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and I think we can see those problems permeating because our current supply chain is um, over, overly focused on automation and we're missing this whole element of resiliency defined in a whole bunch of different ways. So um, we're going to really need to focus on a more balanced approach between people, process, and technology. So um, in closing, this whole COVID thing has been a trigger point for a major shift in supply chain. Um, it's a major trigger point. There could have been a smaller trigger point, but nonetheless, we were due this trigger point, right? So now we have this double whammy of getting hit by a global pandemic and the triggering of the problem with our 20th century supply chain. So uh, we need to focus on more resilience and capability and supply chain companies and uh, national strategies, state strategies need to change in the next five years. Um, this is going to have to happen quick, especially given the fact that this trigger point was so massive. Uh, companies and, and nations and states um, that don't focus on this or companies that countries that do will win, those that won't, that don't, won't, right? It's just a simple, 
um, solution. It's not going to be as simple as just throwing money in a company and saying, you know, bring jobs to our, our nation. We have to really think of a different approach to strategy. And this different approach to strategy is a STEM focus. It's a focus on strategic. Um, and my advice to you high level, and again, we can get more into the details, is you need to retool your teams and yourself. Okay. I know the last five minutes I went on speed round, so let's open it up for some questions. Just a reminder, everyone, that if you do have a question, please type that into the chat function and at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will certainly answer that, have Jack answer it. Um, one question, Jack, that has, has come through is that given the risks associated with global supply chains, um, do, it, and, and perhaps ongoing risks, um, do you expect to see over time a contraction or a shortening of those supply chains to mitigate those business risks? Yeah, Chris, what, what I expect we're going to see is yes and no. I think some supply chains you're going to see are going to shorten. Um, I think some you're going to, but by the way, we need to be really clear that the only way they're going to shorten is through technology and better people process, right? Like, let's just be honest with ourselves. I mean, it, we, the companies have tried to reshore for years, right? Um, but the consumers aren't willing to pay some of these prices. So we're going to have to pick our battles and what we focus on. And I think the ones that we really have to focus on looking at resiliency and scale differently are the two ones that I mentioned, our food supply chain and our medical supply chain. Um, so I think these are the areas of, of utmost focus. Um, how we look at electronics is going to be tricky, right? Because I think some electronics is going to make sense to be more resilient and there's others that are not. Uh, but I think what's really interesting for the people on the call is for you to think through what this means to your, to your company, right? Like what sort of, what sort of situ, what sort of model was best for you? Um, is it to continue in a long mass production supply chain? Does it make sense to really shorten things into these network communities or does it make sense to have a, a blurred model? And this is where the winning is going to happen, right? The companies the supply chain providers, so not just manufacturers, but um, uh, transportation companies are going to have to think of this differently. Software companies are going to have to think of this differently. Distributors are going to have to think of this differently. And most importantly, employees are going to have to think of this differently. So I think um, the real value of the answer is going to be um, how you position yourself as a company, how you position yourself as a municipality, how you position yourself as an employee. Um, and I do ask people to look at what's been happening in China. I mean, there's a lot of things you can question regarding um, how they've handled the pandemic and how you've handled some things. But I think if you look at their view of what supply chains could be, I think you see some, some things that people in the United States can learn from. And so I think um, there's no clear answer to this. And I think the next couple years is going to be important for everybody to position themselves in the right manner to address this. Excellent. Thank you for that. A, another question from an attendee. Um, Jack, how, how best to approach the change the model conversation if focus continues to be short term? quarterly earnings, Wall Street bonuses, uh, the, the political cycle. How do we move from a, as you indicated, a marketing finance orientation that is aligned generally to the US financial markets to this STEM model, which takes a longer term approach, but may not be rewarded quite as much by the financial markets? Yeah, uh, I hate to say what the answer is, but for big and, and I think a lot of people on the on the Zoom know I've worked for big companies most of my career. Um, it's going to be very difficult for big companies to address this problem with proper balance because they it's not like you know they can say, well, Jack Buffington in a webinar said that we should be less focused on this. They, I mean, like the, the 
if I was sitting on the other side, I'd be like, listen to this academic talk about this, right? Um, the pro that I think what's going to happen is you're going to see more startups and more uh, smaller companies be able to take this position, which is going to put even greater pressure on the big companies because, you know, they're, they're saddled with their existing customer. They're saddled with their, their existing investors. So what you're going to see is it's not necessarily how do big companies handle this? Um, it's going to be how is the innovation market going to handle it? And then how is how are the big companies going to respond to that? So um, I think some big companies are starting to look at this thing maybe in a bifurcated manner where they're they're trying to protect their existing model and at the same time have like more of a startup mentality over here. So they kind of hedge their bets. Um, but it's going to happen and it's going to have it's I mean, I've, I've been talking about this for 12 years now, but I think people are looking at this and maybe this is like okay we're tired of this we got to have a new model i think maybe you'll see investors look at it differently so the tide will change on that side i think maybe consumers will see this thing those things will take um more time to pronounce so the question is, is that how does a big company be able to handle both sides of this of this problem good thank you we'll we'll move quickly to to the next question um in evolving the overall approach um, to supply chain within the 21st century economy, how, how do we reach a tipping point? So that as a society um, and perhaps a, a larger business environment thinks differently about supply chain? Well, I think we've reached the tipping point and I think what's key, to, I mean, I think from my perspective here is if you look at these two industries, I think anybody would be hard pressed to say that we haven't reached a tipping point. And so I think right now you're seeing these two industries just right now trying to fight their way through the crisis. But I think once they are able to peek their head out and look at things bigger picture, they're going to have to face this question. Okay. Very good. Uh, next question. When, Jack, you talk about smaller scale kind of community level supply chains, um, what specific size is that? Is it, is it municipal? Is it county level? Is it state level? Yeah, I wish I had more time to talk about this because um, I've done a lot of research on this and this is, this is really exciting. So there's not much in this conversation that is positive, right? Because we're talking about a global pandemic and the collapse of our business system. Um, but what's really exciting, and I wish I had more time and I could definitely talk to people about, is this whole network model of, of um, how we're going to see clusters of manufacturing that's enabled through things like 3D printing, or it's enabled through changes in technology of how you network people, things like blockchain, right? So um, I think it's really exciting. It's hard to explain in like a two minute answer because I know you're, you got another question after this. Um, but anyone who's interested in this, please let me know. I'd love to, to share more details about it. And, you know, one other thing I want to say on this is it, one thing I'm concerned about in the future of supply chains with technology is the more technology that gets into place, the more people are left on the outside of the party, right? So I was born in Baltimore and my city hasn't recovered since the deindustrialization of the 70s. And so what's exciting about like this network community based model is if we can provide the proper education in these places, we have an opportunity to bring more people who've been on the outside back in. Um, and so that gets into more sustainability and resiliency because we're talking not just about customers, but we're also talking about workers. And like I said, I would love to, to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I think these are these are really could be really exciting things that come from this this tragedy. Excellent, and and I think we have uh, a time for one more question, Jack. That is, do you anticipate more foreign investment with the model that you discussed? Uh, you know, big companies moving to consolidate or shorten the supply chain. Yeah, the, the whole question regarding investment is an interesting one. Um, my model is built on small, like the, the beauty of a network community-based supply chain is 
because technology costs are, are falling, um, communities can, can compete against big companies because the capital investment isn't as large. So um, the benefit of this model is a lower capital investment enables more people to be involved. So it's kind of the opposite of what that question is. Instead of expecting big foreign institutional investment, you know, 3D printing and uh, network supply chains enables the investment to be smaller to the point where a community can say, we're going to become a hub ourselves because the, the barriers are lowered due to technology. So I think it's really the other way around. It's really going to flip supply chains inside out. It doesn't mean that there won't be big, large scale supply chains. There will be, but there's going to be a balance of those, the big long tailed ones in China to the clusters that happen all over the world. Okay. Very good. And I'm going to try to slip in. We're, we're a minute over time. Uh, if, if folks need to leave, certainly understand that. But I'm going to try to slip in one more question because I know we have a lot of young supply chain management professionals on the call. Jack is uh, obviously director of DU Supply Chain Programs. For those young and, and upcoming um, supply chain uh, folks, you mentioned retooling of skills. Um, what is your recommendation on how to approach that opportunity if you are an early career supply chain professional? Yeah, and there's going to be some eye rolling from the audience because they're going to hear me say the same thing I've said over and over again. And really what it comes down to is the critical thinking skills that companies need, right? So you talk about um, when, I mean, it's, it's going to be a difficult job market for the next five years. Um, if even longer than that. And so what I tell my students is not to be a statistic, um, to skill yourself to the point where you're a problem solver. Because the one thing that's not going to change, no matter what happens in the, in the economy, is companies need problem solvers. And boy, do we need them right now, right? So if you can learn these structured techniques, um, you're never going to have a problem finding a job, right? But you have to learn how these things work. You have to get back to the foundations of how supply chains have been successful in the past. And so um, that's, that's what I tell the students and it's simple, right? It's not complicated, but it, it takes some understanding of how these things are supposed to work. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, some great dialogue, great questions. Uh, unfortunately, we have exhausted our time together today. Thank you to everyone who joined us and, and especially to Jack um, for sharing his wisdom and insight with us. Um, everyone, please join us for University College's next Quick Connections webinar, which will be one week from today, Friday, May 22nd at 12 noon Mountain Time, when we explore how geographic information systems is helping the global response to COVID-19. More information uh, is at university college, one word, .du, .edu. And, and finally, if, if you're interested in exploring a graduate degree or graduate certificate in supply chain management at the University of Denver, taking the opportunity to study uh, un, under uh, Jack, please visit universitycollege.du.edu for more information. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.